The Book of Virtues, edited by William J. Bennett. Mr. Vinegar and His Fortune, retold by James Baldwin. A long time ago, there lived a poor man whose real name has been forgotten. He was little and old, and his face was wrinkled, and that is why his friends called him Mr. Vinegar. His wife was also little and old, and they lived in a little old cottage at the back of a little old field. One day, when Mrs. Vinegar was sweeping, she swept so hard that the little old door of the cottage fell down. She was frightened. She ran out into the field and cried, John, John, the house has fallen down. We shall have no shelter over our heads. Mr. Vinegar came and looked out at the door. Then he said, Ah, oh, don't worry about that, my dear. Put on your bonnet, and we will go out and seek our fortune. So Mrs. Vinegar put on her hat, and Mr. Vinegar put the door on his head, and they started. They walked and walked all day. At night they came to a dark forest where there were many tall trees. He is a good place to lodge, said Mr. Vinegar. So he climbed a tree and laid the door across some branches. Then Mrs. Vinegar climbed the tree, and the two laid themselves down on the door. It is better to have the house under us than over us, said Mr. Vinegar. But Mrs. Vinegar was fast asleep and did not hear him. Soon it was pitch dark, and Mr. Vinegar also fell asleep. At midnight he was awakened by hearing a noise below him. He started up. He listened. Here are ten gold pieces for you, Jack. He heard someone say, And here are ten pieces for you, Bill. I'll keep the rest for myself. Mr. Vinegar looked down. He saw three men sitting on the ground. A lighted lantern was near them. Robbers! He cried in great fright and sprang to a higher branch. As he did this, he kicked the door from its resting place. The door fell, crashing to the ground, and Mrs. Vinegar fell with it. The robbers were so badly scared that they took to their heels and ran helter-skelter into the dark woods. Oh, uh, are you hurt, my dear? asked Mr. Vinegar. Ah, no, said his wife. But who would have thought that the door would tumble down in the night? And here is a beautiful lantern, all lit and burning, to show us where we are. Oh. Mr. Vinegar scrambled to the ground. He picked up the lantern to look at it. But what were those shining things he saw lying all around? Gold pieces! Gold pieces! he cried, and he picked one up and held it to the light. We found our fortune! We found our fortune! cried Mrs. Vinegar, and she jumped up and down for joy. They gathered up the gold pieces. There were fifty of them, all bright and yellow and round. How lucky we are, said Mr. Vinegar. How lucky we are, said Mrs. Vinegar. Then they sat down and looked at the gold till morning. Now, John, said Mrs. Vinegar, I'll tell you what we'll do. You must go to the town and buy a cow. I will milk her and churn butter, and we shall never want for anything. That's a good plan, said Mr. Vinegar. So he started off to town while his wife waited by the roadside. Mr. Vinegar walked up and down the street of the town, looking for a cow. After a time, a farmer came that way, leading one that was very pretty and fat. Oh, if only I had that cow, said Mr. Vinegar. I would be the happiest man in the world. She's a very good cow, said the farmer. Well, said Mr. Vinegar. I will give you these fifty gold pieces for her. The farmer smiled and held out his hand for the money. You may have her, he said. I always like to oblige my friends. Mr. Vinegar took hold of the cow's halter and led her up and down the street. I'm the luckiest man in the world, he said, for only see how all the people are looking at me and my cow. But at one end of the street, he met a man playing bagpipes. He stopped and listened. Tweedledee, tweedledee. Oh, that is the sweetest music I ever heard, he said. And just he, how all the children crowd around that man and give him pennies. Oh, if only I had one of those bagpipes, I would be the happiest man in the world. I will sell them to you, said the piper. 
Will you? Well, then, uh, since I have no money, uh, I will give you this cow for them. You may have them, answered the piper. I always like to oblige a friend. Mr. Vinegar took the bagpipes, and the piper led the cow away. Now we will have some music, said Mr. Vinegar. But try as hard as he might, he could not play a tune. He could get nothing out of the bad pipes, but squeak, squeak. The children, instead of giving him pennies, laughed at him. The day was chilly, and in trying to play the pipes, his fingers grew very cold. He wished that he had kept the cow. He had just started for home when he met a man who had warm gloves on his hands. Oh, if only I had those pretty gloves, he said. I would be the happiest man in the world. How much will you give for them? asked the man, snobbily. I have no money, but I will give you these bagpipes, answered Mr. Vinegar. Well, said the man, you may have them, for I always like to oblige a friend. Mr. Vinegar gave him the bagpipes and drew the gloves on over his half-frozen fingers. Oh, how lucky I am, he said as he trudged homeward. His hands were soon quite warm, but the road was rough and walking was hard. He was very tired when he came to the foot of a steep hill. How shall I ever get to the top, he said. Just then he met a man who was walking the other way. He had a stick in his hand, which he used as a cane to help him along. My friend, said Mr. Vinegar, if only I had that stick of yours to help me up this hill, I would be the happiest man in the world. How much will you give me for it? asked the man. I have no money, but I will give you this pair of warm gloves, said Mr. Vinegar. Well, said the man, you may have it, for I always like to oblige a friend. Mr. Vinegar's hands were now quite warm, so he gave the gloves to the man and took the stout stick to help him along. Oh, how lucky I am, he said as he toiled upward. At the top of the hill he stopped to rest, but as he was thinking of all his good luck that day, he heard someone calling his name. He looked up and saw only a green parrot sitting in a tree. Mr. Vinegar! Mr. Vinegar! it cried. What now? asked Mr. Vinegar. You're a dunce, you're a dunce, answered the bird. You went to seek your fortune and you found it. Then you gave it for a cow, and the cow for some bagpipes, and the bagpipes for some gloves, and the gloves for a stick, which you might as well have cut from the roadside. Hee <laughs> You're a dunce, you're a dunce. This made Mr. Vinegar very angry. He threw the stick at the bird with all his might, but the bird only answered, You're a dunce, you're a dunce and the stick lodged in the tree where he could not get at it. Mr. Vinegar went on slowly, for he had many things to think about. His wife was standing on the roadside, and as soon as she saw him, she cried out, Where's the cow? Where's the cow? Well, uh, I don't just know where the cow is, said Mr. Vinegar. Then he told her the whole story. I have heard she said some things like, even less than what the bird had said, or more so. Uh, but that is between Mr. and Mrs. Vinegar, and really nobody's business but theirs. We're no worse off than we were yesterday, said Mr. Vinegar. Let us just go home and take care of our little old house. Then he put the door on his head and trudged onward, and Mrs. Vinegar followed him. The Book of Virtues, edited by William J. Bennett. The Magic Thread, from Fairy Tales, 1985. Once there was a widow who had a son called Peter. He was a strong, able boy, but he did not enjoy going to school, and he was forever daydreaming. Peter, what are you dreaming about this time? His teacher would say to him. I'm thinking about what I'll be when I grow up, Peter replied. Be patient. There's plenty of time for that. Being grown up isn't all fun, you know, his teacher said. But Peter found it hard to enjoy whatever he was doing at the moment and was always hankering after the next thing. 
In winter, he longed for it to be summer again, and in summer he looked forward to the skating, sledging, and warm fires of winter. At school, he would long for the day to be over so that he could go home, and on Sunday nights he would sigh. Oh, if only the holidays would come. What he enjoyed most was playing with his friend Lisa. She was as good a companion as any boy. She never took offense. When I grow up, I shall marry Lisa, Peter said to himself. Often he wandered through the forest, dreaming of the future. Sometimes he would lay down on the soft forest floor in the warm sun, his hands behind his head, staring up at the sky through the distant treetops. One hot afternoon, as he began to grow sleepy, he heard someone calling his name. He opened his eyes and sat up. Standing before him was an old woman. In her hand, she held a silver ball, which dangled a silken golden thread. See what I have got here, Peter, she said, offering the ball to him. What is it? he asked curiously, touching the fine golden thread. This is your life thread, the old woman replied. Do not touch it, and time will pass normally. But if you wish time to pass more quickly, you have only to pull the thread a little way, and an hour will pass like a second. But I warn you, once the thread has been pulled out, it cannot be pushed back in again. It will disappear like a puff of smoke. The ball is for you, uh, but if you accept my gift, you must tell no one, or on that very day you shall die. Now, say, do you want it? Peter seized the gift from her joyfully. It was just what he wanted. He examined the silver ball. It was light and solid, made of a single piece. The only flaw in it was the tiny hole from which the bright thread hung. He put the ball in his pocket and ran home. There, making sure that his mother was out, he examined it again. The thread seemed to be creeping very slowly out of the ball, so slowly that it was scarcely noticeable to the naked eye. He longed to give it a quick tug, uh, but dared not do so. Not yet. The following day at school, Peter sat daydreaming about what he would do with his magic thread. The teacher scolded him for not concentrating on his work. If only, he thought, it was time to go home. Then he felt the silver ball in his pocket. If he pulled out a tiny bit of thread, the day would be over. Very carefully, he took hold of it and tugged. Suddenly, the teacher was telling everyone to pack up their books and to leave the classroom in an orderly fashion. Peter was overjoyed. He ran all the way home. How easy life would be now. All his troubles were over. From that day forth, he began to pull the thread a little, just a little, every day. One day, however, it occurred to him that it was stupid to pull the thread just a little each day. If he gave it a harder tug, school would be over altogether. Then he could start learning a trade and marry Lisa. So that night he gave the thread a hard tug, and in the morning he woke to find himself apprenticed to a carpenter in town. He loved his new life, clambering about on roofs and scaffolding, lifting and hammering great beams into place that still smelled of the forest. But sometimes, when payday seemed too far off, he gave the thread a little tug, and suddenly the week was drawing to a close, and it was Friday night, and he had money in his pocket. Lisa had also come to town and was living with her aunt, who taught her housekeeping. Peter began to grow impatient for the day when they would finally be married. It was hard to live so near and yet so far from her. He asked her when they could be married. In another year, she said, then I will have learned how to be a capable wife. Peter fingered the silver ball in his pocket. Well, the time will pass quickly enough, he said knowingly. That night, Peter could not sleep. He tossed and turned restlessly. He took the magic ball from under his pillow. For a moment, he hesitated. Then his impatience got the better of him, and he tugged at the golden thread. In the morning, he woke to find that the year was over and that Lisa had at last agreed to marry him. 
Now Peter felt truly happy. But before their wedding could take place, Peter received an official-looking letter. He opened it and read that he was expected to report at the army barracks the following week for two years military service. He showed the letter to Lisa in despair. Well, she said, there's nothing for it. We shall just have to wait. But the time will pass quickly, you'll see. There are so many things to do in preparation for our life together. Peter smiled bravely, knowing that two years would seem a lifetime to him. Once Peter had settled into life at the barracks, however, he began to feel that it wasn't so bad after all. He quite enjoyed being with all the other men, and their duties were not very arduous at first. He remembered the old woman's warning to use the thread wisely, and for a while he refrained from pulling it. But in time, he grew restless again. Army life bored him with its routine duties and harsh discipline. He began pulling the thread to make the week go just a little faster each time so that it would be Sunday again or to speed up the time until he was due for leave. And so the two years passed almost as if they had been a dream. Back home, Peter determined not to pull the thread again until it was absolutely necessary. After all, this was the best time of his life, as everyone told him. He did not want it to be over so quickly. He did, however, give the thread one or two very, very small tugs just to speed along the day of his marriage. He longed to tell Lisa his secret, but he knew that if he did, he would die. On the day of his wedding, everyone, including Peter, was happy. He could hardly wait to show Lisa the house he had built for her. At the wedding feast, he glanced over at his mother. He noticed, for the first time, how gray her hair had grown recently. She seemed to be aging so quickly. Peter felt a pang of guilt that he had pulled the thread so often. Henceforth, he would be much more careful and sparing with it, and only use it as it was strictly necessary. The first few months later, Lisa announced that she was going to have a child. Peter was overjoyed and could hardly wait. When the child was born, he felt that he could never want for anything again. But whenever the child was ill or cried through the sleepless night, he gave the thread a little tug, just so that the baby might be well and happy again. Times were hard, business was bad, and a government had come to power that squeezed the people dry with taxes and would tolerate no opposition. Anyone who became known as a troublemaker was thrown into prison without trial, and rumor was enough to condemn a man. Peter had always been known as one who spoke his mind, and very soon he was arrested and cast into jail. Luckily, he had his magic ball with him, and he tugged very hard at the thread. The prison walls dissolved before him, and his enemies were scattered in a huge explosion that burst forth like thunder. It was the war that had been threatening, but it was over as quickly as the summer storm, leaving behind it an exhausted peace. Peter found himself back home with his family, but now he was a middle-aged man. For a time, things went well, and Peter lived in relative contentment. One day he looked at his magic ball and saw to his surprise that the thread had turned from gold to silver. He looked in the mirror. His hair was starting to turn gray, and his face was lined where before there had not been a wrinkle to be seen. He suddenly felt afraid and determined to use the thread even more carefully than before. Lisa bore him more children, and he seemed happy as the head of his growing household. His stately manner often made people think of him as some sort of benevolent ruler. He had an air of authority, as if he held the fate of others in his hands. He kept his magic ball in a well-hidden place, safe from the curious eyes of his children, knowing that if anyone were to discover it, it would be fatal. As the number of his children grew, so his house became more overcrowded. He would have to extend it, but for that he needed money. He had other worries, too. His mother was looking older and more tired every day. It was of no use to pull the magic thread, because she would only hasten her approaching death. All too soon, however, she died, and as Peter stood at her graveside, he wondered how it was that life had passed so quickly, even without pulling the magic thread. One night, as he lay in bed, 
kept awake by his worries, he thought how much easier life would be if all his children were grown up and launched upon their careers in life. He gave the thread a mighty tug, and the following day he woke to find that all his children had left home for jobs in different parts of the country, and that he and his wife were alone. His hair was almost white now, and often his back and limbs ached as he climbed the ladder or lifted a beam into place. Lisa, too, was getting old, and she was often ill. He couldn't bear to see her suffer, so that more and more he resorted to pulling at the magic thread. But as soon as one trouble was solved, another seemed to grow in its place. Perhaps life would be easier if he retired, Peter thought. Then he would no longer have to clamber about on drafty, half-completed buildings, and he could look after Lisa when she was ill. The trouble was that he didn't have enough money to live on. He picked up his magic ball and looked at it. To his dismay, he saw that the thread was no longer silver, but gray and lusterless. He decided to go for a walk in the forest, to think things over. It was a long time since he had been in that part of the forest— the small saplings had all grown into tall fir trees, and it was hard to find the path he had once known. Eventually he came to a bench in a clearing. He sat down to rest and fell into a light doze. He was woken by someone calling his name. Peter! Peter! He looked up and saw the old woman he had met so many years ago when she had given him the magic silver ball with its golden thread. She looked just as she had on that day, not a day older. She smiled at him. So, Peter, have you had a good life? She asked. I'm not sure, Peter said. Your magic ball is a wonderful thing. I have never had to suffer or wait for anything in my life, and yet it has all passed so quickly. I feel that I have had no time to take in what has happened to me, neither the good things nor the bad. Now there is so little time left. I dare not pull the thread again, for it will only bring me to my death. I do not think your gift has brought me luck. How ungrateful you are, the old woman said. In what way would you have wished things to be different? Well, perhaps if you had given me a different ball, one where I could have pushed the thread back in as well as pulling it out, then I could have relived the things that went badly. The old woman laughed. <laughs> You ask a great deal. Do you think that God allows us to live our lives twice over? <sighs> but I can grant you one final wish, you foolish demanding man. What is that? Peter asked. Choose, the old woman said. Peter thought hard. At length, he said, I should like to live my life again, as if for the first time, but without your magic ball. Then I will experience the bad things as well as the good, without cutting them short, and at least my life will not pass as swiftly and meaninglessly as a daydream. So be it, said the old woman. Give me back my ball! She stretched out her hand, and Peter placed the silver ball in it. Then he sat back and closed his eyes with exhaustion. When he awoke, he was in his own bed. His youthful mother was bending over him, shaking him gently. Wake up, Peter! You will be late for school. You were sleeping like the dead. He looked up at her in surprise and relief. I've had a terrible dream, mother. I dreamed that I was old and sick and that my life had passed like the blinking of an eye with nothing to show for it, not even any memories. His mother laughed and shook her head. Oh, that will never happen, she said. Memories are the one thing we all have, even when we are old. Now hurry and get dressed. Lisa is waiting for you, and you will be late for school. As Peter walked to school with Lisa, he noticed what a bright summer morning it was, the kind of morning when it felt good to be alive. Soon he would see his friends and classmates, and even the prospect of lessons didn't seem so bad. In fact, he could hardly wait. The Book of Virtues, edited by William J. Bennett, Where Love Is, God Is, by Leo Tolstoy. In a little town in Russia, there lived a cobbler, Martin, by name. He had a tiny room in a basement, the one window of which 
outlooked onto a street. Through it, one could see only the feet of those who passed by. But Martin recognized the people by their boots. He had lived long in the place and had many acquaintances. There was hardly a pair of boots in the neighborhood that had not been once or twice through his hands, so he often saw his own handiwork through the window. Some he had resold, some patched, some stitched up, and to some he had even given fresh uppers. He had plenty to do, for he worked well, used good material, did not charge too much, and could be relied upon. If he could do a job by the day required, he undertook it. If not, he told the truth and gave no false promises. So he was well known and never short of work. Martin had always been a good man, but in his old age he began to think more about his soul and to draw nearer to God. From that time, Martin's whole life changed. His life became peaceful and joyful. He sat down to his task in the morning, and when he had finished his day's work, he took the lamp down from the wall, stood it on the table, fetched his Bible from the shelf, opened it, and sat down to read. The more he read, the better he understood, and the clearer and happier he felt in his mind. It happened once that Martin sat up late, absorbed in his book. He was reading Luke's Gospel, and in the sixth chapter he came upon the verses. To him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And from him that taketh away thy cloak, withhold not thy cloak also. Give to every man that asketh thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. He thought about this and was about to go to bed, but was loath to leave his book. So he went on reading the seventh chapter about the centurion and the widow's son and the answer to John's disciples. And he came to the part where a rich Pharisee invited the Lord to his house. And he read how the woman who was a sinner anointing his feet and washed them with her tears and how he justified her. Coming to the 44th verse, he read, And turning to the woman, he said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath wetted my feet with her tears, and wiped them with her hair. Thou gavest me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but she hath anointed my feet with ointment. He read these verses and thought, I gave no water for his feet, gave no kiss, his head with oil he did not anoint. And Martin took off his spectacles once more, laid them on his book, and pondered. He must have been like me, that Pharisee. He too thought only of himself, how to get a cup of tea, how to keep warm and comfortable. Never thought of his guest. He took care of himself. But for his guest he cared nothing at all. Yet, who was the guest? The Lord himself? If he came to me, should I behave like that? Then Martin laid his head upon both his arms, and before he was aware of it, he fell asleep. Martin! He suddenly heard a voice, as if someone had breathed the word above his ear. He started from his sleep. Uh, who, who's there? he asked. He turned around and looked at the door. No one was there. He called again. Then he heard quite distinctly, Martin, Martin, look out into the street tomorrow, for I shall come. Martin roused himself, rose from his chair, and rubbed his eyes, but did not know whether he had heard these words in a dream or awake. He put out the lamp and lay down to sleep. The next morning he rose before daylight, and after saying his prayers he lit the fire and prepared his cabbage soup and buckwheat porridge. Then he lit some of our, put on his apron, and sat down by the window to his work. He looked out into the street more than he worked, and whenever anyone passed in unfamiliar boots he would stoop and look up so as to see not only the feet, but the face of the passerby as well. A house porter passed in new felt boots, then a water carrier. Presently, an old soldier of Nicholas's reign came near the window, spade in hand. Martin knew him by his boots, which were a shabby old felt once, galoshed with leather. The old man was called Stefan. A neighboring tradesman kept him in his house for charity, and his duty was to help the house porter. He began to clear away the snow before Martin's window. Martin glanced at him, then went on with his work. After he had made a dozen stitches, he felt drawn to look out of the window again. He saw that Stefan had leaned his spade against the wall and was either resting himself or trying to get warm. The man was old and broken down. 
and had evidently not enough strength even to clear away the snow. What if I called him in and gave him some tea, thought Martin. The samovar is just on the boil. He stuck his awl in its place and rose and putting the samovar on the table made tea. Then he tapped the window with his fingers. Stefan turned and came to the window. Martin beckoned to him to come in and went himself to open the door. Come in, he said, and warm yourself a bit. I'm sure you must be cold. May God bless you, Stefan answered. My bones do ache to be sure. He came in, first shaking off the snow, and lest he should leave marks on the floor, he began wiping his feet. But as he did so, he tottered and nearly fell. Don't trouble to wipe your feet, said Martin. I'll wipe up the floor. It's all in the day's work. Come, friend, sit down and have some tea. Filling two tumblers, he passed one to his visitor, and pouring his own tea out into the saucer, began to blow on it. Stefan emptied his glass, and turning it upside down, put the remains of his piece of sugar on the top. He began to express his thanks, but it was plain that he would be glad of some more. "'Have another glass,' said Martin, refilling the visitor's tumbler and his own. But while he drank his tea, Martin kept looking out into the street. "'Are you expecting anyone?' asked the visitor. "'Am I expecting anyone? Uh, well, now, I'm ashamed to tell you. It isn't that I really expect anyone, but I heard something last night, which I can't get out of my mind. Whether it was a vision or a fancy, I can't tell.' You see, friend, last night I was reading the gospel about Christ the Lord, how he suffered and, and how he walked on earth. You have heard tell of it, I dare say. I have heard tell of it, answered Stefan, but I am an ignorant man and not able to read. Well, you see, I was reading how he walked on earth. I came to that part, you know, where he went to see a Pharisee who did not receive him well. Well, friend, as I read about it, I thought about how that man did not receive Christ the Lord with proper honor. Suppose such a thing could happen to such a man as myself, I thought. What would I not do to receive him? That man gave him no reception at all. Friend, as I was thinking of this, I began to doze, and as I dozed, I heard someone call me by name. I got up and I thought I heard someone whispering, Expect me. I will come tomorrow. This happened twice over, and to tell you the truth, it sank so into my mind that, though I am ashamed of it myself, I kept on expecting him, the dear Lord. Stefan shook his head in silence, finished his tumbler, and laid it on its side. But Martin stood up again and refilled it for him. <laughs> Thank you, Martin, he said. You have given me food and comfort both for soul and body. You're very welcome. Come again another time. I'm glad to have a guest, said Martin. Stefan went away, and Martin poured out the last of the tea and drank it up. Then he put away the tea things and sat down to his work, stitching the back seam of a boot. And as he stitched it, he kept looking out of the window and thinking about what he had read in the Bible. And his head was full of Christ's sayings. Two soldiers went by, one in government boots, the other in boots of his own, then the master of a neighboring house, in shining galoshes, then a baker carrying a basket. All these passed on. Then a woman came up in worsened stockings and pheasant-made shoes. She passed the window but stopped by the wall. Martin glanced up at her through the window and saw that she was a stranger, poorly dressed, and with a baby in her arms. She stopped by the wall with her back to the wind, trying to wrap the baby up, though she had hardly anything to wrap it in. The woman had only summer clothes on, and even they were shabby and worn. Through the window, Martin heard the baby crying and the woman trying to soothe it, but unable to do so. Martin rose, and going out of the door and up the steps, he called to her, My dear! I say, my dear! The woman heard and turned around. Why do you stand out there with the baby in the cold? Come inside, you can wrap him up better in a warm place. Come this way! The woman was surprised to see an old man in an apron with spectacles on his nose calling to her, but she followed him in. They went down the steps, entered the little room, and the old man led her to the bed. There, there, sit down, my dear, near the stove. Warm yourself and feed the baby. I haven't any milk. I haven't eaten anything myself since early morning, said the woman, but still she took the baby to her breast. Martin shook his head. 
He brought out a basin and some bread. He opened the oven door and poured some cabbage soup into the basin. He took out the porridge pot also, but the porridge was not yet ready, so he spread a cloth on the table and served only the soup and bread. "'Sit down and eat, my dear, and I'll mind the baby. Why, bless me, I've had children of my own. I know how to manage them.' The woman crossed herself, and sitting down at the table began to eat, while Martin put the baby on the bed and sat down by it. Martin sighed. "'Haven't you any warmer clothing?' he asked. "'How could I get warmer clothing?' she said. "'Why, I, I pawned my last shawl for sixpence yesterday.' Then the woman came and took the child, and Martin got up. He went and looked among some things that were hanging on the wall, and brought back an old cloak. Here, he said, though it is worn out, it's an old thing, it will do to wrap him in. The woman looked at the cloak, then at the old man, and taking it, burst into tears. Martin turned away, and groping under the bed, brought out a small trunk. He fumbled about in it, and again sat down opposite the woman. And the woman said, Oh, the Lord bless you, friend. Take this for Christ's sake, said Martin, and gave her sixpence to get her shawl out of pawn. The woman crossed herself, and Martin did the same, and then he saw her out. After a while, Martin saw an apple woman stop just in front of his window. On her back she had a sack full of chips, which she was taking home. No doubt she had gathered them at some place where building was going on. The sack evidently hurt her, and she wanted to shift it from one shoulder to the other, so she put it down on the footpath, and, placing her basket on a post, began to shake down the chips in the sack. While she was doing this, a boy in a tattered cap ran up, snatched an apple out of the basket, and tried to slip away. But the old woman noticed it, and turning, caught the boy by his sleeve. He began to struggle, trying to free himself, but the old woman held on with both hands, knocking his cap off his head, and seizing hold of his hair. The boy screamed, and the old woman scolded. Martin dropped his awl, not waiting to stick it in its place, and rushed out of the door. Stumbling up the steps and dropping his spectacles in his hurry, he ran into the street. The old woman was pulling the boy's hair and scolding him and threatening to take him to the police. The lad was struggling and protesting, saying, I did not take it! What are you beating me for? Let me go! Martin separated them. He took the boy by the hand and said, Let him go, Granny. Forgive him for Christ's sake. I'll pay him out so that he won't forget it for a whole year. I'll take the rascal to the police. Martin began entreating the old woman. Let him go, Granny. He won't do it again. And the old woman let go. And the boy wished to run away, but Martin stopped him. Ask the Granny's forgiveness, said he. And don't do it another time. I saw you take that apple. The boy began to cry and to beg for pardon. That's right. And now here's an apple for you. And Martin took an apple from the basket and gave it to the boy, saying, I will pay you, Granny. You will spoil them that way, the young rascals, said the old woman. He ought to be whipped so that he should remember it for a week. Oh, Granny, Granny, said Martin. That's our way. But it's not God's way. If he should be whipped for stealing an apple, what should be done to us for our sins? The old woman was silent. And Martin told her the parable of the Lord, who forgave his servant a large debt, and how the servant went out and seized his debtor by the throat. The old woman listened to it all, and the boy, too, stood by and listened. God bids us forgive, said Martin, or else we shall not be forgiven. Forgive everyone, and a thoughtless youngster most of all. The old woman wagged her head and sighed. It is true enough, said she, but they are getting terribly spoiled these days. Then we old ones must show them better ways, Martin replied. That's just what I say, said the old woman. I have had seven of them myself, and only one daughter is left. And the old woman began to tell how and where she was living with her daughter and how many grandchildren she had. There now she said. I have but little strength left, yet I work hard for the sake of my grandchildren, and nice children they are, too. No one comes out to meet me but the children. Little Annie now won't leave me for anyone. It's grandmother dear, grandmother dear, darling grandmother. And the old woman completely softened at the thought. 
of course, it was only his childishness, she said, referring to the boy. As the old woman was about to hoist her sack on her back, the lad sprang forward to her and said, Let me carry it for you, Granny. I'm, I'm going that way. The old woman nodded her head and put the sack on the boy's back, and they went down to the street together, the old woman quite forgetting to ask Martin to pay for the apple. Martin stood and watched them as they went along talking to each other. When they were out of sight, Martin went back into the house. Having found his spectacles unbroken on the steps, he picked up his awl and sat down and began to work. He worked a little, but soon could not see to pass the bristle through the holes in the leather, and presently he noticed the lamplighter passing on his way to light the street lamps. Seems it's time to light up, thought he. So he trimmed his lamp, hung it up, and sat down again to work. He finished off one boot, and turning it about, examined it. It was all right. Then he gathered his tools together, swept up the cuttings, and put away the bristles and the thread and the awls, and taking down the lamp, placed it on the table. Then he took the Gospels from the shelf. He meant to open them at the place he had marked the day before, with a bit of Morocco, but the book opened at another place. As Martin opened it, his yesterday's dream came back to his mind, and no sooner had he thought of it than he seemed to hear footsteps, as though someone were moving behind him. Martin turned around, and it seemed to him as if people were standing in the dark corner, but he could not make out who they were. And a voice whispered in his ear, Martin, Martin, do you know me? Who is it? muttered Martin. It is I, said the voice, and out of the dark corner stepped Stefan, who smiled and vanished like a cloud, and was seen no more. It is I, said the voice again and out of the darkness stepped the woman with the baby in her arms, and the woman smiled, and the baby laughed, and they too vanished. It is I, said the voice once more, and the old woman and the boy with the apple stepped out, and both smiled, and then they too vanished. And Martin's soul grew glad. He crossed himself, put on his spectacles, and began reading the gospel just where it had opened, and at the top of the page he read, I was hungry, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. And at the bottom of the page he read, Inasmuch as ye did it unto these, my brethren, even these least, ye did it unto me. And Martin understood that his dream had come true, and that the Savior had really come to him that day, and he had welcomed him. Book of Virtues, edited by William J. Bennett. Courage, by John Galsworthy. At that time, said Ferdinand, I was in poverty. Not the kind of poverty that goes without dinner, but the sort that goes without breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and exists as it can on bread and tobacco. I lived in one of those four-penny lodging houses, Westminster Way, three, five, seven beds in a room. If you pay regularly, you get to keep your own bed. If not, they put someone else there who will certainly leave you a memento of himself. It's not the foreigners' quarter. They are all nearly English, and drunkards. Three quarters of them don't eat. Can't. They have no capacity for solid food. They drink and drink. They're not worth wasting your money on cab drivers, newspaper boys, sellers of laces, and what you call sandwich men. Three-fourths of them brutalized beyond the power of recovery. What can you expect? They just live to scrape enough together to keep their souls in their bodies. They have no time or strength to think of anything but that. They come back at night and fall asleep. And how dead that sleep is. No, they never eat. Just a bit of bread. The rest is drink. There used to come to that house a little Frenchman with yellow crow's-footed face, not old either, about thirty. But his life had been hard. No one comes to these houses if life is soft, especially no Frenchman. A Frenchman hates to leave his country. He came to shave us, charged a penny, most of us forgot to pay him, so that in all he shaved about three for a penny. He went to others of these houses. This gave him his income. He kept the little shop next door, too, but he never sold anything. 
how he worked. He also went to one of your public institutions. This was not so profitable, for there he was paid a penny for ten shaves. He used to say to me, moving his tired fingers like little yellow sticks, Peef! I slave! To gain a penny, friend, I am spending four pence! What would you have? One must nourish oneself to have the strength to shave ten people for a penny. He was like an ant, running round and round in his little hole, without any chance but just to live, and always in hopes of saving enough to take him back to France and set him up there. We had a liking for each other. He was the only one, in fact, uh, well, except for a sandwichman who had been an actor and was very intelligent when he wasn't drunk, the only one in that warren who had ideas. He was fond of pleasure and loved his music hall, must have gone at least twice a year and was always talking of it. He had little knowledge of its joys, it's true, hadn't the money for that, but his intentions were good. He used to keep me till the last and shave me slowly. This rests me, he would say. It was amusement for me, too, for I had gotten into the habit of going for days without opening my lips. It's only a man here and there one can talk with. The rest only laugh. You seem to them a fool, a freak, something that should be put into a cage or tied by the leg. Yes, the little man would say. When I came here first, I thought I should soon go back, but now I am not so sure. I am losing my illusions. Money has wings, but it's not to me it flies. Believe me, friend, I am shaving my soul to these specimens. And how unhappy they are, poor creatures. How they must suffer. Drink, you say, yes, that saves them. They get a little happiness from that. Unfortunately, I have not the constitution for it. Here and he would show me where he had no constitution. You too, comrade. You do not seem to be in luck. But then, you are young. Ah, well, fait être philosophie. But imagine what kind of a game it is in this climate, especially if you come from the south. Well, I went away, which was as soon as I had nothing left to pawn, and he gave me money. There's no question of lending in those houses. If a man parts with money, he gives it, and lucky if he's not robbed into the bargain. There are fellows there who watch for a new pair of shoes or a good overcoat, profit by their wakefulness as soon as the other is asleep, and promptly disappear. There's no morality in the face of destitution. It needs a man of iron, and these are men of straw. But one thing I will say of the low English... They are not bloodthirsty, like the low French and Italians. Well, I got a job as a fireman on a steamer, made a tour tramping, and six months later I was back again. The first morning I saw the Frenchman. It was shaving day. He was more like an ant than ever, working away with all his legs and arms, a little yellower and perhaps more wrinkled. Ah! He called out to me in French, there you are, back again. I knew you'd come. Wait till I have finished with this specimen. I have a lot to talk about. We went into the kitchen, a big stone-floored room with tables for eating, and sat down by the fire. It was January, but summer or winter there was always a fire burning in that kitchen. So, he said, you have come back? No luck? Ah, Patience, a few more days won't cure you at your age. What fogs, though! Ah, oh, you see, I am still here, but my comrade, Pigeon, is dead. You remember him? The big man with black hair who had the shop down the street? A mere fellow, good friend to me, and married. Fine woman, his wife. A little ripe, seeing she has had children, but of a good family. He died suddenly of heart disease. Wait a bit, I will tell you about that. It was not long after you went away, one fine day in October, when I had just finished with these specimens here and was taking my coffee in the shop. 
and thinking of that poor pigeon, dead then just three days, when a pom comes a knock, and there is Madame Pigeon, very calm, a woman of good family, well brought up, well made, a fine woman, uh, but the cheeks pale and the eyes so red. <sighs> Poor soul. Well, madame, I asked her, what can I do for you? It seems this poor pigeon died bankrupt. There was not a cent in the shop. He was two days in his grave, and the bailiff's in already. Ah, monsieur, she says to me, what am I to do? Wait a bit, madame. I get my hat and go back to the shop with her. And what a scene! Two bailiffs, one would have been better for a shave, sitting in a shop before the Bessons, and everywhere, Montfoy everywhere, children, tick tick, a little girl of ten, very like her mother, two little boys with little trousers, and one with nothing but a chemise, and others, two quite small, all rolling on the floor. And what a terrible noise, all crying, all but a little girl, fit to break themselves in two. The bailiffs seemed perplexed. It was enough to make one weep. Seven, and some quite small. That poor pigeon, I had no idea. The bailiffs behaved very well. Well, said the biggest, you can have four and twenty hours to find this money. My mate can camp out here in the shop. We don't want to be hard on you. I helped Madame to soothe the children. If I had the money, I said, it should be at your service, Madame. In each well-born heart there should exist humanity. But I have no money. Try and think whether you have no friends to help you. Monsieur, she answered, I have none. Have I had time to make friends, I, with seven children? But in France, madame? None, monsieur. I have quarreled with my family, and I reflect it is now seven years since we came to England, and then only because no one would help us. Well, friend, that seemed to me to be very bad. But what could I do? I could only say, hope always, madame. Trust in me. And I went away. I went away, and all day long I thought how calm she was. Magnificent. And I kept saying to myself, come, tap your head, tap your head, something must be done. But nothing came. The next morning it was my day to go to that sacred institution, and I started off still thinking what on earth could be done for that poor woman. It was as if the little ones had got hold of my legs and were dragging at me. I arrived late, and to make up time, I shaved them as I have never shaved them. A hot morning, I perspired. Ten for a penny, ten for a penny. I thought of that, and of the poor woman. At last I finished and sat down. I thought to myself, Ah, oh, it's too strong. Why do you do it? It's stupid. You are wasting yourself. And then my idea came to me. I asked for the manager. Monsieur, I said, it is impossible for me to come here again. What do you mean? says he. I have had enough of your ten for a penny, ten for a penny. I'm going to get married. I cannot afford to come here any longer. I lose too much flesh for the money. What? he says. You're a lucky man if you can afford to throw away your money like that. Throw away my money? Pardon, monsieur, but look at me. I was still very hot, you see. For every penny I make, I lose three pence, not counting the boot leather to and fro. While I was still a bachelor, monsieur, it was my own affair. I could afford these extravagances. But now it must finish. I have the honor, monsieur. And I left him. 
I walked away, and I went to the pigeon's shop. The bailiff was still there. <laughs> he must have been smoking the whole time. I can't give them much longer, he said to me. It is of no importance, I replied, and I knocked, and I went into the back room. The children were playing in the corner, that little girl, a heart of gold, watching them like a mother, and Madame at the table with a pair of white gloves on her hands. Oh, my friend, I have never seen such a beautiful face. She was so calm, but so pale, so frightfully discouraged, so overwhelmed. One would say she was waiting for her death. It was bad. It was bad. With the winter coming on. Bonjour, madame, I said. What news? Have you been able to arrange anything? No, monsieur. And you? No, I said. And I looked at her again. A fine woman. Oh, a fine woman. But, I said... An idea has come to me this morning. Now, madame, what would you say if I asked you to marry me? It might possibly be better than nothing. She regarded me with her beautiful eyes and answered, But willingly, I will marry you, monsieur. And then, comrade, but not till then. She cried. The little Frenchman stopped his story and stared at me hard. Hmm, I said at last. My dear Frenchman, you have courage. He looked at me again. His eyes were troubled, as if I had just paid him a bad compliment. You think so? He said at last, and I saw that the thought was gnawing at him, as if I had turned on the light on some desperate dark feeling in his heart. Yes, he said, smiling, taking his time, while his good yellow face wrinkled and wrinkled, and each wrinkle seemed to darken. I was afraid of it, even when I did it. Seven children? Ah, oh, seven! Once more he looked at me. And since, sometimes, sometimes I could... He broke off suddenly. Then he burst out. Life is hard, my friend. What would you have? I knew her husband. Could I just leave her to the streets? The Book of Virtues, a radio drama, four stories. Mr. Vinegar and His Fortune, retold by James Baldwin. The Magic Thread from Fairy Tales. Where Love Is, God Is, by Leo Tolstoy. Courage by John Galsworthy. This production was produced, edited, and read and performed by Sarah Everett. Thank you to Jeff Brown and KTOO for the making of this production. Thank you for listening. The Book of Virtues, a radio drama. <laughs>